All right, thank you everyone for joining today's webinar, Using Live Traffic Over a CIPRI Link to Identify and Locate Passive Intermodulation. My name is Ben Stone and I'm with RCR Wireless News. Our speaker today will be Emilio Franchi, Senior Product Manager for Enritsu Company. Emilio is a Senior Product Manager in the Service Infrastructure Solutions Division of Enritsu Company in Morgan Hill, California. He has more than 21 years of varied experience in the RF and microwave instrumentation arena, including base station testing, mobile testing, and network optimization for LTE, LTEA, UMTS, CDMA, EVDO, and GSM, GPRS, Edge Networks, plus CIPRI RF and BBU emulation testing. As a note and housekeeping, the webinar and the slides will be available to you all for download after the presentation today. Please be sure to enter any questions that you have for Emilio during the presentation at any time as well. With that, I'll give it away to Emilio. Thank you, Ben, yes, uh, and thank you for attending. As Ben mentioned, my name is Emilio Franchi, and I'll be covering um, a, a new concept on making BIM measurements using the CIPRI link. So the agenda is really to first cover what is, very quickly, what is traditional RF PIM, the advantages of using PIM over CIPRI, how to locate it, how to set up the test, um, running the test, some examples, and I do have a video, of uh, a short video um, that actually is running uh, a live test on there, and then we'll get into the, the summary and questions at the end. So if most of you are familiar with uh, traditional RF PIM, you're setting up two uh, calibrated CW tones, so your F1 and F2 separated at a certain frequency, you're usually either using 20 watts or 40 watts per tone, and you're getting uh, uh, you're you're using that as as uh, then you're testing for the IM products or the intermod products that are created by that uh, F1 F2 combination. So whether it's IM3, IM5, IM7, and so forth. So the traditional measurements are done in both relative using the relative DBC value, which is the total uh, CW output power minus your uh, IM power, or uh, an absolute level, which is using DBM. So it's basically calculating the actual IM product's uh, DBM value and using that as your pass-fail limits. So when you're doing a traditional RF PIM test, um, you're normally turning down the site you either have to climb the tower or access the remote radio head depending where it's located. You need to calibrate your test equipment. You need to use a frequency specific tester to do a PIM test. You need to disconnect the coax from the RH, clean the connectors, connect the test equipment, torque it. Uh, you run a PIM test. If you have PIM, then you usually run this is the PIM to locate it. Then you also need to fix the PIM problems. And normally you repeat this process until the, the PIM is uh, PIM values below your pass fail limits. Again, disconnect the the cable from the uh, test equipment, clean those connectors, reconnect the R to the RH, torque the, the connector, and then turn the site back on. So normally you'll be down probably at least 30 minutes, possibly longer. And if it's a, a rooftop mounted, you may actually be uh, searching for multiple uh, PIM sources on the roof and it could be longer. So what are some of the advantages of now going over to this new process of uh, PIM over CIPRI? So it is a patented, it's a new patented measurement. Uh, some of the things that are, uh, that are advantages are that it's uh, frequency independent. So all CIPRI IQ data is ba at baseband. So it doesn't care if it's 850, 1900, 2100, 1800, 2500. So all of it's at baseband, uh, which allows you to have a single product or a single measurement tool to, to make you. Uh, the other difference is we're not setting out two CW tones. We're actually using live LTE traffic. So it's a real world pin scenario in a sense. And, um, but it does bring up some differences that I'll be discussing in a few slides. Uh, the other advantage is that if you're doing a, a PIM test with the CIPRI link is that you could be at ground level and you can connect your test instrument uh, through a, an optical tap to the BBU. Normally for this test, we'll be looking at also both the downlink and the uplink, and this is what the, the, one of the differences uh, on the uh, PIM or CIPRI measurement. 
There are two uh, scenarios that we can cover with the current tool that we have. Uh, the self-generated PIM, so for example, if you have a 700 megahertz uh, RH transmitting out, it can, its subcarriers will mix and can potentially create Intermont products. And then we can actually then look at the uplink of that, of the, our, of that 700 to find if there's got PIM in it. So in this scenario, in this graphical example, you can see that the uh, fiber optic cable is attached directly to an optical tap, whether it's already pre-installed on site or if it's a temporary tap that you will install to make the measurement. Um, then from that tap, you connect from the uh, back to the BBU. So basically you re-establish the connection from the RH to the BBU. The other two connections that are going to your test equipment, one, the down, one is the downlink, one is the uplink, and those are basically monitor ports at that point. That allows us to look at both the downlink and the uplink to make a PIM or SIPRI measurement. Uh, the other uh, scenario is a harmonic test. So in this example, we're looking at the, let's say, for example, the 850 cellular downlink and the 1700 uplink, which is the, 20, the AWS in North America, or the, would be the 1800 uplink in international markets. So in this scenario, you would have two uh, fibers coming down. Uh, connecting to the optical taps. So it could be multiple taps or it could be one that can handle multiple sectors. And the, uh, then you would also have jumpers going from the tap back to the BBU for both of those uh, bands. And then you would have your uplink and downlink. So in this case, the downlink would be the 850 band. The uplink would be the 1700 band because the 850 can generate a second harmonic in that 1700 uplink. And that's what we'll be testing for. So one of the other things is because there are, um, you know, a lot of folks that are doing uh, SIPRI RF based uh, uh, measurements can sometimes look at a uplink signal and determine if there's a, a possible PEM because you get that shark fin uh, signal on there. The thing is, it doesn't tell you where it is or the location. So one of the things that we can do currently is tell. Uh, is determine if the PIM is either internal or external to the antenna system. So if it's external to the antenna, uh, to the antenna system, um, you don't need to break your RF path. So basically you don't need to disconnect uh, the cables from the RH or the antennas and allows you then to concentrate on going and doing a, say, a typical PIM hunting uh, scenario where you're going out with uh, either a Yagi antenna or a PIM specific antenna and a spectrum analyzer and trying to find where the spikes in the sig uplink signal occur, uh, whether on a rooftop or farther out. If, it, if PIM is found to be internal, then you can call a tower crew uh, and at that point can uh, have them change jumpers, antennas, or, uh, and also just do a traditional uh, PIM test, follow the, uh, uh, the, the mop each carrier has. So, so one of the things that needs to happen to make a proper PIM or SIPRI measurement is to turn off on max power all resource blocks. So that forces the radio to transmit uh, to max transmit power on all RBs. In most cases, this would be RBs that are uh, unused. So any user traffic would be left alone. Uh, this helps to uh, the, uh, this helps create more PIM sources or actually a worst case PIM, PIM scenario because now you're transmitting at full power and it's similar to, uh, for example, uh, with a Nokia Alu radio, you would turn on what's called OCNS and that basically then turns on all unused RBs and leaves the, uh, like I mentioned before, the, uh, U, uh, the U, UE traffic from customers uh, alone, so for normal operation. How's the, the measurement actually work? So this is just a, a, a concept on how, how it's working. Um, on the right side, we see the MIMOS, in this example, two by downlink, MIMO zero, MIMO one. You see the subcarriers there. The subcarriers are missing, are, are mixing and creating potential IM products on the uplink, which is the light blue one on the left. So the algorithm has to look at all of the downlinks and the individual uplink at the same time to make a proper PIM or SIPRI measurement. 
And one of the things that it has to do is align the signals in time. So it aligns the, the two down links and it aligns the uplink uh, in time. So you need to make this measurement in real time, looking at all the components at the same time. Once that happens, then on the left side, we still get the uplink, but now if you see that purple trace, that is what we call correlated PIMs. It's a calculated PIM based on the combination of the two downlinks and the potential IM products that are happening on the uplink. And that then is displayed, as well as some other components, some other uh, measurements, which I'll show you a little bit later. So there are a few new um, measurements that are associated with PIM over CIPRI, since we are not using a traditional system where we have two calibrated CW tones, uh, PIM over CIPRI uses what's called PIM desensitization, which replaces the DBC. Uh, the PIM desensitization, I'll say PIM desense, because okay, so, it's a, word, a mouthful, <laughs> is a relative value in DB, and it quantifies how much PIM degrades the uplink noise floor. So basically, what's the rise in your noise floor due to PIM? It does use the LT carriers RBs. Um, and uh, one of the examples that we've heard multiple times from different carriers is the fact that a PIM desense value of 10 dB affects data throughput by 50%. The other measurement, as I mentioned earlier, is correlated PIM, which is displayed in either DBFS or DBM. So that's the calculated value of PIM based on the information we're seeing from the downlink and the uplinks at the same time. Um, OEMs use DBFS or DB full scale when talking about the what this is the separate link, which is the digital level showing DB relative to maximum value represented on the separate link. And that is a, for a better word, a sliding scale. There is no set, you know, zero DBM reference, for example. It is uh, uh, specific to each OEM manufacturer's radio model. Uh, to convert DBFS to DBM, it requires uh, a little knowledge. So we do need to know the radio noise floor and the noise figure of the radios. And I'll have a slide actually that covers how, where that can be converted. And each um, OEM has specific values for the radios. In some cases, it's universal. In other cases, it's uh, model specific. <coughs> and so getting into now the, actually the configuring the measurement, um, to configure the measurement, it does require quite a bit of information. Uh, the nice thing is once this is set up, it can be saved and distributed via USB. Uh, we, we created a single page where all the setup can ha happen and broke it up into different sections. So the first one on the upper left is called the site configuration. Um, in this example, we have some SISO, 2x2 MIMO, 2x4 MIMO as options. On the upper right, we have the pass-fail value for PIM descents. Yeah, and that value will change uh, depending on each carrier's. Just like when you do a PIM, uh, RF PIM measurement, you, different carriers have different pass-fail values. The same thing would happen with PIM descents. The next two sections are the downlink and uplink configurations. So there are some key uh, settings here, such as the center frequency for the downlink and the uplink, as well as the LTE bandwidth of the carriers. Those help determine which IM product I'll be looking at or harmonic for that matter. Uh, the next section is basically the uh, AXC group number that I'll find the LT carriers on or the MIMO carriers. Uh, for most vendors, it's safe to start on AXC group zero and then go to one. Um, and you can set that up as your, your defaults, for example. Um, the next uh, setup is actually the line rate. So we actually created an automatic detection for the line rate for both the downlink and the uplink, um, as well as on the far right, the radio configuration. And I think in the next example, it shows Alu Nokia downlink and Alu Nokia uplink. Uh, you click on that, you'll get a pull down menu. You can choose the vendor that you, you need to use. And in the middle is a downlink view configuration button. So I have two examples of that. So the idea there is to ver verify that those AXC groups are the correct AXC groups and you do have the carrier set up correctly for the measurement. Below that we have the uh, uplink under test section and basically this tells the system how to run the test. From my, ex my, my experience, I would suggest uh, for the first time running cycle through all ULs or all uplinks. 
So basically, if you have two or four uplinks, it will actually uh, measure one when it's finished and gives you the results. So it'll automatically step to the next one, and the next one, and the next one, it'll keep cycling through. Um, the one after that, which is just a specific uplink, that is, let's say you find PIM on one of those uh, uplinks that you're testing, and you want to get more information on that, you can actually then specify a specific uplink to, to test. When, <coughs> excuse me. When you hit save and measure, it'll actually set up and configure the measurement and auto start it so that it'll take you directly to the measurement page and start the, the measurement automatically. So this is an example of the view of the downlink configuration. So the downlink and the uplinks are distinctly different. If you can see the uh, curved rise and fall of the downlink signal, we're actually getting that directly from the BBU. And that's what it looks like. So you'll, in, in this case, I'm not sure if the detail you have on your laptop, but we have two of them. We have a yellow and a green one. And on the upper left, it says AXC group number zero and one, zero in yellow and uh, one in green. Let's say, for example, one of those was configured incorrectly. You would get a flat line, possibly with a, looks like a noise floor. You can press the proper button and actually then edit the AXC group until you have the correct one set up. This is a sample of the uh, uplink, as you can see the uh, sharp vertical rise and falls of the carrier. So that helps you determine if you're looking at the uplink or the downlink correctly. And this allows you again, uh, in this an example, I have four of them, um, allows you to test, change or edit each one of those uh, uh, uplinks or downlinks, uh, AXC groups also. And if you see that it's not correct, So this is where we do the conversion for the DBFS to DBM. Um, we do it's, it's what we call the advanced settings. Um, you can reset your PIM descents pass fail limit here also, but the key parameters are the radio noise figure uh, and the thermal noise floor in DBFS. Um, the other thing that we need to know is if, it, if that thermal noise floor is specified for a specific bandwidth or if it's specified across all bandwidths. So if it's across all bandwidths, that means the uh, in radio internally compensates for uh, the, the different gains that are there for the different bandwidths. And if, if it's only for, but if it's specified for a single bandwidth, then our algorithm has to compensate for that, th that difference. And then result units can be ch uh, changed to DBM as opposed to DBFS. And when I first started, DBFS was a little confusing to me. Um, is definitely worse than you know your normal starting point for zero dBm. But in, in the, uh, you know if we know the, the the thermal noise floor or of the of the radio, you can then basically think of that value as your noise floor, your zero dBm uh, re, uh, value, and then you can see the gains uh, and losses based on that. So these are some examples of actual measurements. This is in our lab. So we actually had a PIM source that was basically 100% PIM. Um, but the, the key, uh, and then you see the light blue trace, which is the uplink, and the purple trace, which is the, the uh, correlated PIM. But the values in the table below are the key ones here also. So uh, the first one is the measurement state. So that lets you know that uh, the, what's going on in, in the measurement. So when the, the initial time you run this, process, it will take about 55 seconds for each uplink to measure because it takes all that time uh, synchronizing the downlinks and the uplinks. So it'll basically say um, acquiring, then measuring, and then complete. Now, if you forget to turn on, uh, if there's not enough downlink power, for example, because you don't always need to turn on max power all RVs, then it will give you a, a pop-up message will happen on the screen where the spectrum is. It'll tell you not enough downlink power, please turn on. Uh, max power all RBs. And you'll also get a, like a, an idle or a fail message on the measurement state. Once you turn that uh, power up, rerun the test, and then it'll basically, like I said, acquiring, measuring, and when it completes, it'll actually then fill out the table. It'll give you a pass fail based on that limit that was set. It'll actually give you the PIM descents value that it measures. So in this case, it's 100% so it's 30 dB. On the fail, it's 0 0.01 dB on the pass. It'll give you the total uplink power. It'll also give you the correlated pin power, as well as the location, whether it's internal or external to the antenna system. 
So I do have some examples also here. Uh, this is a field test on a Nokia radio. Um, we actually did have, uh, we tested all four uplinks. Only the fourth one had a PIM in it. Uh, turned out that the carrier knew that also, so it was a good test for us to validate what their results were showing. Um, so we did have a, the, the proper fail value. In this case, I was running it as DBFS. Uh, turned out there was a water tower that's a, that was affecting the, MIMO, the fourth MIMO uplink uh, and reflecting back uh, enough PIM to cause problems there. Uh, so basically, due to that um, descent value, our noise floor rose by over 3, three, three dB. So basically, I'm seeing a 3.34 in descent, so that's how much my noise floor raised through that uh, extra PIM in there. And this is a, a Samsung test. Not a lot of traffic here, but, you know, so this is, I guess, another example of where a display can look bad, but just look at the actual values. So even though the purple trace has that shark fin, look, just look at the correlated pin value, which is minus 122. Total uplink power was only minus 102. So that's well below anything that would cause issues, as well as the pin descent was 0 0.04 dB. So there's virtually no impact on the uplink. It just looks like it could. So these are uh, the current verified scenarios that we can support, the uh, Nokia Alcatelucent, Samsung, and Huawei, and the uh, SISO 2x2 and 2x4 MIMO uh, configurations. The algorithm is scalable for more scenarios and configurations, so we are gonna be working on adding more capabilities. There's a short video, I did it. Um, so I mentioned it takes about 55 seconds to run the initial test. Once it runs that initial cycle, it remembers the synchronization, so it only takes about six seconds to step through each uh, additional uh, uh, uplink. So this is where I started recording, because I didn't want you guys sitting through about five, five minutes of uh, testing. So it's about a 20 second, 26 second video. So here we go. So you can see it's stepping through each one. Um, the, the yellow one is the last, com the yellow box shows the last completed measurement. So it will give you the uh, PIM descent value as well as the uh, uh, total uplink power correlate PIM and location. So summarize, so the PIM over CIPRI is a new patent measurement that's the only in-service PIM measurement that can make frequency independent PIM test, ground level PIM testing, real world test real world PIM scenarios on LTE traffic. Um, basically allows you to test PIM without turning down radios for extended periods of time. And it can locate whether PIM is internal or external to the antenna system. So that is it for me. And we can hit questions. I think they're somewhere popping up. Okay. Awesome, uh, thank you so much, Emilio. Uh, I want to start off with a couple of questions. Um, so. What if uh, my cell site does not have optical taps built in? Can I measure without the taps? Um, no, you actually do need to have the taps uh, connected. You do, um, it's the only way you can actually monitor both the downlink and the uplink while live traffic is going on. So uh, there are a lot of temporary taps that can be installed. And you know, after you get used to installing them, it normally takes me less than 30 seconds to install one on site. Great. And I'll, I'll add a little more. Most, uh, the first couple of times you, you, you install one, or, or always, depending on the practices of your, the carrier, uh, you probably want to lock down the radio just to be on the safe side before you disconnect the fiber from the BBU to connect into the tab. And then once you've, you have your jumper back into the BBU, unlock the radio, and you're back and running. Great. So how easy is it to temporarily install a tab for measurements? Uh, uh, like I mentioned, it's it's real, it's pretty easy, but the, I guess you just have to do it a few times. Um, it takes me, like I said, less than thirty seconds. Uh, the taps that uh, that are used have two uh, main connections. One is intended for taking the uh, that plug the the fiber that's actually plugged into the BBU that goes into the main the typically the first port of your tap. The second one has a duplex jumper 
that will plug back into the BBU. At that point, you're back up and running. You check for that green light. So make sure you got a good connection between the RRH and the BBU. Uh, and, and then you can use your simplex cables uh, or uh, to connect to downlink and uplink on the test equipment when you're measuring the, the, the BIM. Okay, great. Um, so this question is from the audience. What is DBFS and when is it used instead of DBM? Okay. Um, uh, DB full scale is what DBFS stands for. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. Um, and it's, it's normally used if you cannot get the, um, well, uh, if you, well, we do have a lot of the, the values for a lot of the OM radios. If you don't, if you're not f uh, sure about all of the components, which is basically the thermal noise floor of the radio in DBFS or the noise figure, then you would try to stick with the DBFS. So the algorithm will use that value if it doesn't have the correct DBM to give you um, uh, uh, the correlated PIM value. So it's, it's a, um, how should I say, you use the DBFS when you're not sure about all the conversion factors you need for DBM. Okay, so does PIM over SIPRI give me the same results as RF PIM? But it's similar, so it will tell you whether you have PIM and uh, roughly where it's located. So an RF PIM value, uh, test will give you, uh, uses two calibrated tones, so it will give you a DBM or DBC value based on that, because you're looking at a CW Intermod product. Uh, in this case, though, we're looking at a, at a broadband LTE-based uh, PIM product using the PIM over SIPRI. So similar, but not the same. Awesome. So do, do you need multiple versions of PIM over SIPRI to cover multiple frequencies? Um, no, since uh, all SIPRI uh, information is at baseband, so it doesn't, uh, SIPRI doesn't really care if it's, or I should say that the SIPRI link doesn't care if it's uh, an 850, 700, 1900 uh, megahertz uh, frequency, it, it converts everything down to baseband. What we do need to do is put that information into the measurements so that we can actually determine the correct IM product we're calculating for. Uh, what are the most common causes of PIM at rooftop sites? On rooftops, uh, a lot of the, the, the a lot of the problems are going to be the edge uh, at the edge of the buildings, especially if the, the the radios are set back from the edge of the building. It's they, they put metal caps on the edge, and that will uh, possibly whether it's just metal or it starts rusting, it'll, it'll, it'll potentially create PIM. Also, a lot of the screws that are done, even if they're underneath some of the uh, the sheathing. Uh, on the roof, if they get water in there, they'll start creating a, you know, they rust and they'll basically become a, a diode. And even though they're underneath some plastic, it will still generate them. So rooftops can have a lot of different uh, IM products potentially. Awesome. Uh, a question from the audience. From slide uh, 22, did the carrier know that, that was from integrated testing or was it from an OEM tool? Oh, how did they know they had PIM there? Yes. Yeah, so uh, let me go here, um, 22. So yeah, so they, they had, um, so they just had a, a, a noise floor, a high noise floor value on one of their, uh, on their uplinks. And so they, I believe they actually did do an RF PIM test also. So they took us to it, but at that point, I think it was a, one of those uh, scenarios where they needed the coverage even, and they would accept a certain amount of PIM. So they, it, it was left there, and then we were able to go to that site and validate the results they had gotten earlier. Awesome. Uh, how do you differentiate between internal and external? So when the algorithm is making the measurement, it's looking at a couple of things. Like part of it would be the delay that it's getting from uh, the PIM source. Also, whether uh, the PIM is coming in from multiple uh, antennas or, uh, or if it's coming in through one antenna. So it, there's a multiple differentiation. So um, the algorithm figures out where the where the intent. That's a rough, uh, for better word, distance to BIM. Figuring out where the the antenna system is, and then it's looking to see whether the PIM is happening beyond or or or, or internal from a time based perspective. And 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 how um, how does the 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 unit locate? Fault, so with the location of faults. 
Right. So, so, so we're we're not it's, we're not at the full distance to PIM capability yet, but we are at the you know are you internal or external to that antenna system at this point? And so, you know, part of the the value there is the fact that if you know it's external to the antenna, you don't tear apart that antenna system. You know, it's and 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 hire the tower crew to 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 work on it, so you can then start looking for external sources of PIM. So how does equipment determine if the pin is internal or external? Um, same reason as earlier, basically, it's, it's a time-based um, measurement as well as uh, uh, looking at how many, if it's happening across all of the, uh, for better word, uplinks uh, and, and downlinks, and it can make a, a better determination that way. Great, thank you. Um, so why was there a slope if there was no pin? Um, well, there's there's always a little bit of PIM in every system, you know, uh, and so there's this the slope also happens. I think it's uh, with LTE. This is the slopes happen because of the what they call. I think if if folks have gone through Tom Bell's training, it's he calls it the layered cake of, of, uh, effect. So you have your you start from the middle and you step out and you have different ion products and they get wider. Ion products get wider the farther out you go. And so you're catching a little bit of, you know, where where that say it's IM three to five slope happened. So you're, and whether it, you know, even if it's a small level, you're still going to get that slope. It's what you have to look at is what is the total uplink power? What is my total correlated pin power? And is that and that descends value? And if that value is low, then it's really not impacting it that much. But from, from experience, there's always going to be PIM in a system. It's just how bad is it? Sure. And how were you able to determine that the PIM was caused by the water tower? Uh, well, we, well the, the, we knew it was external to the system. Uh, we didn't know it was the water tower, but the technician that we were with did because of the previous testing they had done. Awesome. Is there a limitation on the SIPRI rate at the site? Uh, this we can handle on this gear up to uh, SIPRI rate eight, line rate eight, so the 10.1 uh, gigabits per second. <clears throat> so, does the equipment detect second order or fourth order intermodulation? It can do uh, the well, I guess we'll call it um, the, the harmonics. So, it'll do the second, third, fourth. It really depends on the uh, the potential for it to fit in, like I did the example of the H50 with the 1700 uplink, that would be your second harmonic or intermod if you want to think of it that way. Can you use this application for indoor DAS build? Uh, yes, yeah, but it, you know, the, the limitation is always going to be on the, the branching. So I have done testing on DAS systems, so I believe it was 30 dBm. The, as long as you do turn on that max power all RBs and you have enough um, you know, you create the, the worst spin scenario, you have enough downlink signal, you can make a measurement. I was able to successfully make measurements on that DAS system on multiple sectors. Uh, again, though, well, troubleshooting is a little tougher on a DAS system because you're going through so many splitters on different levels. So if, if we do find DAS, I guess the, uh, just like a traditional PIM tester, the difference is we're limited to the, the head end where you can't go to where the actual, you know, to the different uh, splitters that are physically located. But you can always put a load, if you want to split it manually, put a load so that we're only seeing the specific, on one, on one side of the splitter and only look at one branch at a time. So you can uh, identify a little bit easier which side has PIM if you do find PIM. Awesome. I just want to make a note as these questions come through. Um, anyone who wasn't able to, to hear me earlier, but we will send the recording and these webinar slides to everyone who's registered with that email. So just bear that in mind, please. Um, anyways, yes, thank you for these questions and definitely uh, keep coming through. Um, is distance to PIM feasible when using CIPRI? I'm sorry. Uh, is, yeah, is distance to PIM feasible when using CIPRI? Uh, it is feasible. So that's one of the things that the algorithm is scalable. Uh, we, we haven't implemented that uh, at this time, but it's something that we are looking to do in, in the near future. And is it always necessary to turn on unused RB before the test? Uh, you don't turn off unused RBs. Uh, basically, uh, what you're doing is turning on unused RBs to max power. 
So that's really what you want to do is basically generate, um, uh, just like a, in a sense, you're sort of simulating slightly the pimp tester. So the pimp tester is going to put out, you know, two CW tones at 20 or 40 watts. So what we want to do is max, max power on all the RBs that are not used, that we have max downlink power. Uh, so that it can generate the, the most uh, the a strong intermod product if it's present. Awesome. And if you're measuring PIM during live traffic over P PRBs, how do you know what PRB contains as PIM and not traffic or other cell noise? So that's actually at the something the algorithm will look at. And and, and I know uh, well, I'll, I'm not the expert on the algorithm, so I know somebody. The, the person that did it is way smarter than I am, um, but it, they can actually uh, identify uh, the PIM from the combination of the, the downlinks, uh, the different RBs, because we're really looking at the subcarrier level. So an RB is made up of a thousand subcarriers, and we're looking at the RF components uh, at the subcarrier level as opposed to just the RBs. Wonderful. So how do you retrofit your current BTS so that it can be, so it can do these measurements, options needed on BTS currently, and what options do you need to add? So if you already own uh, our BTS master with uh, the, the, the tradition, this normal Cipri RF uh, card, you just get option 754, which is our PIM over Cipri option. So it's a software upgrade. If you don't, then you, you do need to get a hardware. Um, it, it's a card that goes into uh, our option slot in the BTS master. And then you get the, the software option for that. So can existing BTS masters be equipped with C CPRI option? Uh, yes, they can. Mm -hmm. Actually, I should say the um, 8221B models, 22B models and the 20T models can be. <clears throat> so are the DPFS to DPM conversion factors for the different radios published somewhere? And if so, where? Um, well, we have, they're, they're not published. We, we, we do have some based on um, s some knowledge direct from OEMs, some knowledge from uh, testing out in the field. So, you know, we can provide those as, as needed. But yeah, so and also if if the um, the users can ping their OEM vendors, that that's also helpful. Wonderful. Um, so is the instrument uh, recommended in a previous migration analysis of in a design scenario for Tetra Networks? And um, not for Tetra. We'd have a different product that handles the Tetra, uh, and unfortunately, that one. Um, already uses the, the one available slot in that product uh, to for its a uh, most of the land mobile radio um, products require a CW or a, a narrow band signal generator and so that signal generator takes a takes that one slot that was available in the product that does the land mobile radio uh, measurements awesome it, is there or will there be a feature for distance to pin uh, Yes, there will be. <laughs> awesome. And has AT and T provided documentation support uh, that's been approved by the U.S. for testing this way? Um, no, this. You know, we've just released this in the last couple months, so we need to go out and um, and, and you know, and it's a new process. So there will be uh, some time where these processes need to be updated, but we are working on them, and we'll be doing a lot of trials coming up in the, within the next couple months. Awesome. Is this a module and software upgrade to an 8222 or if you've already had the C, the CIPRI model, is it just a software upgrade? Um, it's both. <laughs> so if it's a, it's a hardware, if you, if you don't already have the CIPRI hardware, you, you do need the hardware and then the software upgrade. If you already have the hardware, it's just a software option. In which step does the unit ask to execute commands to turn max power of RBs? So it's not in the unit. It, that is handled uh, by the OEM software that's in, uh, almost every site I've been to, the technicians have access to the OEM software that allows them to dial in for their specific site and turn that feature on. 
Is it accepted by major carriers as official PIM documentation? Uh, no, like I mentioned before, we are in the process of getting that um, accepted. Yeah. yeah. And then how many carriers um, RRHs can it test? So it's, it's one at a time when it does a measurement. Um, so it, uh, it, it just, um, so I, I guess at a, at a site it can do, it should be able to do all of them. Or uh, the only scenario that it, uh, it currently cannot do because it requires, uh, we, we, have, we support two SFPs. So an AWS uh, PCS combo scenario is one that this current solution cannot do. Because it requires, that would require three SFPs. Great. Does PIM add up serially if multiple PIM sources are in internal PIM? Or what about external? Uh, it, it does for both. So, you know, so, so when you get a PIM power value, it's basically the, the combination of all the PIM sources. Uh, but as you fix, so the, the, the concept for PIM or is similar to for RF PIM, base PIM, which is fix the strongest PIM source. And then, um, you sh then you'll be able to then uh, see the, the the other PIM sources easier. Uh, but yeah, so the the and when you fix fix the strongest, you'll you'll see the value drop, and, and you keep fixing until you get below the pass the pass fail value that's acceptable to the carriers. Sure. And kind of on top of that, is there a way to know if the PIM fault is internal or external by looking at the tester results? Uh, yes. So in the table at the bottom, it says PIM location. Uh, and so that that will actually tell you whether it's internal or external to the antenna system. Does the instrument PIM over CIPRI also support um, OPSI interface? Uh, the PIM over CIPRI does not currently support OPSI. Okay. Great. So as for boosting unused PRB for PIM testing, is it available in all vendors like Ericsson, Huawei, and Samsung? Um, yeah, so I know, uh, so I know in, um, Nokia calls it OCNS, Ericsson calls it AILG. I'm not sure what Samsung calls it, but they do have that feature. Wonderful. Is there a PIM over time measurement? No, this is because it's not, uh, it's a real time as far as determining the PIM, but we're, uh, we're capturing information, uh, in, in short frames. So it's not a continuous, um, uh, I should say, you're, you're not getting continuous flow of PIM like an RF tester because the CWs are just transmitting CW tones. In this case, we're actually capturing and then doing a, a huge amount of mathematical computation to determine if there's PIM based on the IQ data. So we're looking at raw IQ information, which is uh, in the, the megabytes. So it's unfortunately, because of that, we cannot do a, uh, a PIM versus time measurement. So it's not, so I think most people are used to the tap test where you walk around and uh, if you have access to the connectors and you tap on them, uh, then you would see PIM. So in this case, that's, that type of test is not uh, available. Awesome. Um, can it auto read any of the carrier, carrier info for test setup? No, currently not. So this, so again, so the, well, I think that, Back. So there are radio presets have, when you choose that, it will actually autofill the IQ bit with data and the reserve bit data that you need for the normal spectrum view that most CIPRI testers do today. Um, so using that same information, then we can uh, auto, for a better word, auto configure. The one thing we, that's manual is the AXC group uh, settings. So that one is based based on uh, yeah, each, each site being a little bit different. But like I mentioned before, for most vendors, uh, AXC Group Zero is a good starting point for that configuration. So, so I guess it's a, it's a mostly yes, except for the AXC Group. Great. Um, looks like we're sort of uh, coming up to um, having answered most of our questions. Um, so definitely keep asking any questions that you have. Uh, thanks again for the great questions everyone's had so far. It's been really, really great to see the engagement. Um, so Emilio, um, can, can it be localized on the source of PIM for internal? Uh, no, I mean, in, in most cases, no, it's just telling you that's internal. Um, in most installations, though, that's usually not too uh, 
big a, an issue because it's usually a jumper, a short jumper to an antenna. So it's basically those two components when you're talking about RHs. Um, you know, where it might be an, a bigger issue is where you may still st have a macro style scenario where the RH is down below and then you have a long um, coax running up to the antenna. So there's still some installations like that, but the majority are, are basically jumpers to antennas. So basically like a three meter or, or five meter jumper. Uh, to your directly to the antenna. Okay, great. Um, I think that uh, I think that's most of the time that we have. Uh, I'll answer. We'll have Emilio answer two more questions. Um, so, is there PIM over eSIPRI support? So uh, it's not currently there. It is something we'll be looking at. eCIPRI is slightly different. Um, the, the the question, the the, the key uh, concept there, or actually, and that'll be, they'll apply to every CIPRI based measurement. Is uh, if we have access to the IQ data, if we have access to the IQ data, then it's possible to do this. But the difference is that we're um, uh, the. Transport protocol is a little different because now you're going to a packet-based system uh, on eCIPRI. So, you know, as long as we can uh, take care of that, we'll, which, which we should be able to, then, yeah, we can do that. Great. Um, so one of the last questions, and I guess, and, and if you want to also maybe uh, leave us with any final thoughts, but uh, how reliable is external and internal location when the fault's the antenna? Ah, uh, so hmm, that's a good question. Uh, I'd have to, to be honest, I have to ask our, our uh, the the FPGA engineer. I, I I'm going to say it's pretty reliable, and I'm going to say it's going to say internal, but I want to double check so I can uh, put that out a little bit later. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think that's a good good time to mention. You know, everyone's had some really great questions, so um, uh, we're definitely happy to follow up with you afterwards if we were unable to get to any of your questions, or if you have any further, more in depth uh, questions. Uh, again, uh, the team would be happy to answer that. So, Emilio, do you have any final closing thoughts for us? Um, just want to thank everybody for for attending. Really appreciate your time, and uh, you know, give this uh, this is an interesting new concept for measuring PIM, and uh, hopefully, also you're saving capex cop and opex cost based on uh, you know being able to determine whether you have PIM or, or not you know, within your system before you you know you make that decision to spend additional uh, money. Great. Uh, well, thank you so much for your time, Emilio. And um, on behalf of RCR Wireless News, um, thank you to our audience as well for your great questions. And uh, we look forward to um, having you join us again in the future.